Welcome to Biblical Genetics. This is Dr. C. I'm coming at you today from Audubon's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary, just east of Naples, Florida. This is an amazingly beautiful place. If you like to walk and pray at the same time, this boardwalk is a great place to do it. It's just a, a mile or so loop, lovely trees, tons of birds in the winter time, and because of coronavirus, there aren't many people here. So I get to enjoy this basically all to myself for at least I don't know, I haven't seen anyone in 10 minutes. This is really cool. I love being outside, love exploring nature. And for some strange reason, I am pulled to the Blackwater Swamp. I love cypress trees. I love the strangler figs. I love this whole entire ecosystem. In fact, it's probably my favorite land-based ecosystem, even though I am a marine biologist and I am, of course, particularly fond of coral reefs because I'm a coral reef scientist. But um, on land, I think the cypress swamp is my favorite. But I want to use the name corkscrew swamp to get into a question of the corkscrew inside all of our cells the DNA molecule you like that little segue there corkscrew the DNA double helix I thought that was pretty cool but I want to just throw out some statistics to you I want to just throw you some numbers and see if we can wrap our heads around the immensity of the scale of what we're talking about about nine months or so ago I was in Maine I was in Maine, I gave, did an episode <laughs> called Most Viruses Are Good on Biblical Genetics. I was standing on a frozen lake, we're doing ice fishing. That was a fun episode. You might want to go look at that if you're interested in viruses. Just a week or so later, I was in the Florida Keys and I went really far south. I crossed over the nine mile bridge right at sunset. I said, okay, I got like 15 minutes to do an episode. So I scrambled out, I got all my stuff set up and I started talking about DNA and how big it was and things like that. And the sun started setting and I lost all my light and I never actually released that episode. So this is me trying to make up for that a couple months later. I want to talk about DNA and the absolute sheer immensity of it. Back then, I had just finished two episodes, one at the north end of US-1 and one at the south end of US-1. That's between Maine and southernmost Florida. That highway runs all down the east coast. And I tried to compare the length of the highway to DNA, but since I didn't release it, I can't use that statistics. But just yesterday, I was on US-41. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one, twenty-four, twenty-seven, thirty. I paced across the highway. It was about thirty feet. Let's call that about ten meters. US forty-one just happens to be almost exactly two thousand miles long. And if you would like, we can call that thirty-two hundred kilometers. So now we have a thirty-two hundred kilometer long highway. What do you think would happen to your DNA if you stretched it out 3,200 kilometers? Instead of six feet or about two meters that you have in each cell, what would happen if you stretched out 3,200 kilometers? How wide do you think it would be? Well, DNA is only about two nanometers or about two billionths of a meter wide. That makes um, 0.0032 meters if it was 3,200 kilometers long. That's only 0.32 centimeter, 3.2 millimeters. So 3,200 kilometers long, 2,000 miles long, and it's only about that wide. In fact, if it was lying on the road people are driving on, they probably wouldn't even notice your DNA. That is how incredibly thin this molecule is. The scale here, it's so hard to even get your brain around because it makes no sense that something could be that long and that thin at the same time. In fact, if you were to take your DNA and make it as wide as a human hair, average human hair is about 15 millionths of a, or 15 microns, 15 millionths of a, of a meter wide. And that makes it about, um, well, you'd have about nine and a half, 9.3 miles of DNA if it was as wide as a human hair. And at that scale, the DNA would be packed into something about the size of a basketball. Imagine if you had a book written out on a string that was nine miles long and you had it packed into a basketball. And someone said, hey, um, go look up chapter one. Let's say this book is the Bible, right? Find John 3.16. Find Genesis. Tell me how many books are in the Bible. How many verses are in the Bible? Where is the verse that says Jesus wept? Can you find those things? No way, it would be lost in this mass of tangled wires. And then as you try to pull the string out and read it, you would be making knots and you'd be breaking it and you have a giant bird's nest, a giant disaster. And yet your body handles this at a scale that you can't even see with the naked eye. 
And if a knot forms, there are enzymes that come and they cut the DNA, pass one strand through another, and heal them up again. So you don't get a giant bird's nest. Who engineered this system? Well, our brilliant genius creator, God. I've heard various estimates of how many cells are in the human body, anywhere between about 20 trillion to about 100 trillion cells. Let's take just 50 trillion as a midpoint. And it's convenient because you have two meters of DNA in each cell, so you have about 100 trillion meters of DNA in your body. How much is that? Well, if you were to take all your DNA and stretch it end to end, it would take light traveling at 300 million meters per second. 3.9 days to get from one end of your DNA to the other. If you were to make a circle out of your DNA, you could lasso the entire solar system. In fact, the radius would be 15.9 trillion meters. The orbit of Pluto is inside a DNA loop made out of your DNA. Your DNA would make 669 trips to the sun and back. Your DNA could wrap around the sun 22,000 times. It's just a bunch of string. It's just a bunch of fragile, sticky, delicate string with information written on it. This string is a computer program. It's a code. It controls who you are and what you do and what you look like and how you behave in a lot of different ways. It is so well engineered. It is so amazing. We should do nothing but worship our creator when we learn about the DNA. In fact, this makes me want to cite Psalm 139, 12 through 15. For you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My friends, when we consider nature, when we consider what God has created, we should fall to our knees and worship and praise that creator. When we talk about the engineering that's involved, we talk about the scale, how tiny things are, how large things are, at the same time. We talk about this computer program that's written into the most improbable molecule in the world. And the only normal response a person should have is praise for the creator of DNA and human life. So that was Carter's quick and dirty guide to DNA statistics. Lots of numbers I know, lots of complexity I know, but something in there maybe you'll remember and hopefully just remember to be amazed by your creator. If you like more information about genetics, you can go to biblicalgenetics.com. You can look me up on creation.com. That's my main employer. I do appreciate all the people helping support this show. If you'd like to do so, just look in the show notes. There's a couple of links there. One for buymeacoffee.com and one for patreon.com. Two different ways to support. You don't have to, but I would really appreciate it if you would share this show with other people and just tell them about it. Tell them something you learned. If you have a science teacher, I bet they want to know about DNA. If you're a homeschool mom, I bet your kids want to know about DNA. People need to hear the information. And I'm doing my best to spread it, but I need people like you to help share it. You have an awesome day.